Uh, Mohamed El Shahid is a fiercely independent curator, architectural historian, and a critic focusing on architecture, design, and material culture of the 20th century Egypt and the broader Arab region. He is the author of the highly acclaimed and best selling book, Cairo Since 1900 An Architectural Guide, that was published in 2020, and you can see it upstairs in the gallery. He's the winner of the 2021 Egypt State Award for Architectural Publication. Uh, with his book, uh, his book, Revolutionary Modernism, Architecture and the Politics of Change in Egypt between 1936 and 1967, was published by Egypt's National Center for Translation uh, in Arabic. Uh, previous curatorial projects uh, before this particular exhibition include uh, Cairo Now uh, at the Dubai Design Week in 2016, The Past is Present, Becoming Egyptian in the 20th Century at the British Museum in 2018, uh, Mudun, Urban Cultures in Transit at the Vitra Design Museum in 2017. He is the curator of the British Museum's Modern Egypt project and Egypt's winning pavilion uh, at the 2018 London Design Biennale. Uh, in 2019, Apollo magazine named him among the 40 under 40 influential thinkers and artists in the Middle East. And in 2011, he founded Cairo Observer, which is a multifaceted platform uh, that again explores uh, culture in uh, in Egypt and, and the Arab world at large. And we'll probably be talking about that a little bit more, a little bit more tonight. Uh, more importantly, I was extremely fortunate to work with Mohammed on this exhibition. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so welcome back to New York, Mohammed. <laughs> Thank you, Rami. Thank you very much um, for hosting this conversation. So for everybody here who uh, maybe doesn't know you very well, can you tell us a little bit about your trajectory and how you ended up uh, sort of in the curatorial uh, and, and uh, architectural history world? So I started out um, as a, an architecture student, um, actually across the river in New Jersey at the New Jersey um, Institute of Technology. And um, shortly after starting that degree, uh, driven by curiosity in architecture based on my upbringing and in Alexandria in particular and in Kuwait as well, um, that sort of uh, generated an interest in architecture. So that's how I ended up studying it. But it was very quick after that I realized that there's more to, let's say, um, what I would like to explore in architecture than what the professional degree was going to lead to. At least not, it wasn't necessarily looking like it would have been for me. Um, I was, for example, very frightened by the prospects of having to use AutoCAD. So um, so from there, and, um, and actually this is one of those occasions in which uh, crossing paths with um, a certain sort of uh, good doer uh, makes things happen. So one of my professors suggested why not uh, go on and do a master's and that's what got me to MIT's um, uh, program for Islamic architecture, which interestingly at the time was focused uh, as the title of the program suggests on more perhaps uh, pre-modern um, architectures of the predominantly Muslim societies. Um, and uh, my interests were pretty much uh, modern in 20th century. And uh, so I remember when I was starting that program in 2005, I was, you know, one of the still first batch of, of people throughout the program's entire history that who focused on a, on a modern topic. And I think since then things have changed a bit because typically um, when we talk about Islamic societies or the Muslim world or Arab world, um, in terms of architecture, the focus has been pre-modern, whatever that means, and typically that means pre-colonial encounter, which is also a pretty vague um, time frame. I'm not sure when that exactly happens. Um, and so the so from there, um, there were a lot of issues, I guess, or limitations within an architecture a program to discuss some of the issues that uh, were of interest to me. You can't talk about the 20th century and architecture without talking about politics. Um, and so uh, that's what actually got me to NYU, uh, just around the corner uh, in the Middle East Studies program. Uh, so I can explore these topics further. So as you can see, it's kind of a journey that it's uh, academically at least that sort of hopped um, from one island to another and those islands tended to have very little communication with one another uh, as sort of academic disciplines or areas of study. Um, yeah, so really after my PhD, um, which uh, I submitted in 2014, um, a couple of opportunities opened up. I had already been living in Egypt uh, since 2010. 
and decided to stay uh, when 2011 unfolded. Um, and so being already there and having already established Cairo Observer um, and being energized by what the city had to offer um, and also witnessing the destruction of quite a lot of the architecture and urban fabric of that place, um, I decided to stay. Um, and uh, several opportunities brought me into the curatorial world. Uh, one would be, uh, for example, that uh, Dubai Design Week exhibition, Cairo Now, City and Complete uh, exhibit. Uh, which was meant for Dubai Design Week, but ended up being extended for a month, uh, which is a theme, I guess, since this exhibition itself uh, was supposed to end in, in January and it's been extended till tomorrow. Um, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, and then there was the British Museum opportunity, which was um, focused on collecting objects of uh, material culture to be added to the museum's collection. And those objects were meant to be of everyday life, um, to basically be able to speak about the politics, culture, um, and um, consumption and production of, uh, of 20th century Egypt. Um, so that's kind of a summary. So um, we're going to be talking uh, a lot about the exhibition itself, I think. But before mm -hmm. we do that, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about Cairo Observer. Uh, for everybody here who doesn't already follow Cairo Observer, uh, you should uh, check it out on Instagram for sure, because it's, um, it's really just an incredible uh, sort of visual and narrative journey uh, through Egyptian history and, and through Cairo specifically. Um, and, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you started that? Because I do think that that, that in a way leads to the kind of uh, thinking that informs the exhibition. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so like I said, I arrived uh, back in Egypt uh, in 2010. The last time I had lived in Egypt full time was uh, when my family immigrated to the United States in 1995. So in that 15 year gap, um, I basically, uh, you know, I hadn't been living in Egypt and, and I had become an adult and a different person in a way. Well, we don't really change, I think, but that's a different story. But, you know, it was a new side of me, I suppose, uh, trying to understand this place. Um, and so I saw things, I think, with an eye that a lot of the people that I was meeting in Cairo who had been there the whole time uh, weren't necessarily, were taken for granted, as always happens when you live in a place uh, and then an outsider comes or a visitor comes. Um, you know, you start to hear things about your everyday from a different perspective. And so I was always talking and commenting about um, um, urban issues in the city. Um, um, let's say the most common example, and it's something that I feel a lot of the Arab world suffers from, is how counterintuitive a lot of the interventions um, tend to be, which are very top down. Um, and so to me, it always seemed a bit odd because it always seemed like quite a lot of effort was being put into doing, making things more difficult. Um, and I think now with some hindsight, we have better understanding of the politics behind this. Uh, it always was explained as stupidity. You know, that's a very common way of uh, explaining or for a society, I guess, to deal with these kinds of, under that kind of pressure to explain these kinds of interventions. But I would say that's a very facile way of uh, understanding what's what is still happening and what has been happening. Um, you know, because these interventions require plans, budgets, uh, and someone to actually make them happen. Um, whether uh, you know, it's also laws that lead to the destruction of of fabrics, uh, historical fabrics. Um, you know, the, there's effort put behind this. So I wouldn't discount all of this as. Uh, stupidity, it's clearly part of some sort of political agenda that's that's been on the table. So at the time, this was pre-2011, when 2011 erupted, um, and I lived literally blocks away from Tahrir Square, so it was kind of uh, meant to be that I witnessed this. Um, and I think witnessing here is a, an interesting word that just came up because, um, you know, that's how I thought of the idea of observer, Cairo observer, uh, as a sort of a witness, which also happens to be weirdly enough, and it didn't, took me years to even make the connection, but, you know, my last name is Shahid is also witness. Uh, so somehow it was also kind of meant to be. Um, and the idea was to really start it as a blog where I air out these uh, observations about the, yeah, these things that I just discussed. 
Um, but it kind of grew uh, an audience quite fast. Um, I'm not an institution oriented person, um, I actually at all, I'm just not wired that way. So unlike Afikra, for example, which from 2014 until now has grown to a, a kind of a global network of, of various chapters and, and that sort of thing. Tower Observer from the beginning till now is basically a one person project. Um, it's essentially my pen name. <laughs> um, um, although it has opened, yeah. One thing that is interesting about that that I want to quiz you, and again, that informs exhibitions like the one that we saw or that informs sort of your your more formal, let's say, publication work is that, um, you know, it's a, Cairo Observer is a very graphic medium mm -hmm. and is also a very democratic medium, right? It's on Instagram, it's sort of bite-sized, it's easily digestible, it's extremely graphic. I mean, it's just so, you know, your, your, one of your strengths is just kind of graphic curation and the finding of, um, of amazing content to share and sort of crafting the stories around that. So what's your experience been like in terms of, um, you know, again, spreading narratives in this very democratic way or very accessible way? Um, so there's two things to say on the use of the term democratic here. So uh, when it started as a blog, that was one thing, but quickly I realized that part of the popularity uh, in terms of an audience building up um, was the fact that there was very little space um, for people, whether outside Cairo, to read about the issues I was writing about on Cairo, um, which actually is part of why this kind of project that you see upstairs is there. Uh, it's trying to fill in a narrative, or I always like to use the metaphor of a, of, a of a picture that has parts of it pixelated. So if the world is set of a picture, um, we certainly have parts that are crisp, clear, and then others that are really pixelated. That makes it really difficult for someone to navigate across the whole picture. So it was an effort to fill in. So, and also for Tyrians and Egyptians in general, especially architecture students, um, there's very little space. So it did open up for uh, the years that I was living full time in Cairo. Um, and people can still browse CairoObserver.com and they'll see content in by a wide variety of people. I would say that's kind of the democratic moment um, of the platform, uh, if I can call it a platform. Um, and then, you know, after the British Museum job and, and other things, 2016, 2018, um, yeah, 2018, around that, um, I stopped the, the blogging for many reasons, and we can talk about this. Um, but, and, and in the meantime, Facebook was really big um, still in Egypt in terms of circulating narrative and issues and topics. So a lot of the content actually kind of shifted to Facebook. Um, and then I got off Facebook to protest to that platform. <laughs> and unfortunately, in the meantime, I bought Instagram, which I only joined relatively recently. So the Cairo Observer page on Instagram is only a couple of years old. It's actually born in basically in the pandemic, um, in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so that's just me mostly curating the content that you see on there. But yes, it, it does have, I suppose, the, the openness that yeah, it's accessible. Um, um, I, I recently started to do my best to include captions in both Arabic and English when I can. Um, and yeah, of course, the discussion and comment section is always, um, yeah, sometimes depends on the post as a space for, for debate. Um, yeah. The graphic bit, uh, I think it's just the nature of the material that attracts me. Um, I am a very visual person and I do think that part of what um, has been kind of made blurry in our imagination of our cities and our visual cultures of the 20th century and until now uh, is the visual element. I mean, Google image search, I think made things really obvious for me when I, you know, 10 years ago when Google had just started um, a Google image search for Cairo gave you like basically five prototypical images. And I think you can do this for a lot of global South uh, locations where the, the prominent representation, even through a platform that seems to be democratic in the sense that, you know, everybody thinks that if you have access to the internet or Google, that means somehow you're connected to the world. Although you would, if I asked anybody, what do you think is going on in China today? Like they'll have no idea, you know, like so, or like, or even somewhere in Latin America, they'll have no idea. So, I mean, I think the illusion of connectedness is one issue here, but the other issue is that we rely to too much on what these platforms propose that they can offer. So the Google image searches, when I was doing my research uh, and, and trying to also find content for Cairo Observer was so limited. I think this has cha changed a bit. It's still not incredible uh, or representative. But along the process of doing this, I realized, okay, there's a need for more images out there, uh, more of the material, kind of uh, visual material that got me to be who I am anyway today. 
Um, so let's let's get into that in the in the context of this exhibition. I really want to start talk, talking to you a little bit about that. So to put together an exhibition like this, what are what are the primary sources that you can rely on to actually gather this photographic material and the information? So that's a huge question and also a super important one because it re relates to exactly what I was just saying before. We have very limited options, um, and I think. Um, you know, one of the consequences of when we talk about colonialism, and it's really interesting that, you know, it depends on who you are, the concept of colonialism means very different things. So for some people, it's this thing that conveniently just happened and ended some time ago, and, you know, there's no connection with others, it's an ongoing process. Um, with others, it's a lived experience, so it really depends. But one of the consequences is access to information, uh, access to images, most important, importantly. I mean, for example, if you want to look at um, footage of pretty key 20th century events that really shape our realities today, uh, you and I, and probably everybody in the room, um, the most reliable or maybe not reliable, but accessible footage, maybe if you find something will be something like British Pathé, which is like a propaganda arm of, of the British military and state, essentially. Um, and so the narrative that's provided and the images are provided all like, you know, it's, it's really imagine trying to talk about uh, uh, an event that involves British colonialism in a place like Egypt, but my only accessible um, set of footage uh, online is coming from a British propaganda media outlet. So, you know, very problematic, very limiting. Uh, you know, for another example that I can give just upfront when I was doing the, the the timeline that you saw upstairs on, on one of the walls uh images that had to do with really critical issues that have to do with apartheid colonialism and so on uh those were not the ones on usually on public domains you had to really find dig hard and you know the the, the sort of the images that drive home the point of what was going on atrocities uh that sort of thing they're not available they're not accessible and when they do exist they're not public domain they're owned by corporations or the sort of more philanthropic um, sort of legs or arms of, uh, of corporations um, that essentially benefited from a colonial history, like the Getty, for example, uh, that's an oil tycoon. Uh, but just so trying to find the images about apartheid and, um, and, and colonialism that are owned by the Getty in order to show them in an, in an anti or like a a post-colonial exhibit or publication, that's a pretty um, kind of twisted way of going around knowledge production, I think. Um, but that also is a, a um, you know, it's very clear indication of, of how things are at the moment. And honestly, this applies to ongoing events, you know. Um, I wonder what in 20 years, if somebody wants to look back and look at the um, atro atrocious situation in Afghanistan, which nobody talks about, of course, now. Nobody talked about it two months ago, nobody talked about a month ago as much, and certainly nobody's talking about that today, but it's still ongoing. 20 million people are basically being starved to death uh, due to policy. Good luck finding an image of that online, <laughs> you know? So, so images are really key to talk about these issues, um, let alone architectures. And actually our conception of history, including architectural history, is very much shaped by that. So I'll say that for now, but we can come back and discuss this further. I have a lot to say on that. Yeah, and so I think another another facet of this that I think came into play very early on when we started talking about the exhibition, um, and again, you know, just was was much less uh, was much more difficult to articulate precisely because of the absence of actual archival narratives re related to that is uh, the whole sort of gendered aspect of it uh, and of architectural history and. One aspect of it that is somewhat made evident in the exhibition above is that um, a lot of modern architecture uh, in, the, in the early days, in the 30s uh, and 40s, was propagated by female patrons. And female patrons had a sort of a very prominent role in actually you know, hiring architects, encouraging the modern style to, uh, to, to, to spread in that context, et cetera. And yet that's a very difficult story to tell from an archival point of view or from a, uh, again, a kind of graphic point of view, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, a great point because uh, it was important for me. I mean, for example, a lot of the interest currently 
on women in architecture tends to focus on the architect as a profession. Right. Uh, so as a side point, just to start off, you know, uh, if you look at a lot of the schools of architecture across the region today, uh, certainly in Egypt, I'm not really sure, I can generalize about a lot of other places, but I know certainly in Egypt, architecture schools are completely dominated by, or not dominated, but there's a very strong uh, presence of women in uh, the student body and also in the teaching, uh, the faculty. Um, but that's not present somehow in the profession. So a lot of people, and there's a lot to be said about why that is, you know, um, how that translates. But looking back um, into this period that I was looking into for the exhibit and for the book, um, I think if we want to understand the role of, well, anyone really in, in a situation, it's, it shouldn't be through one lens of who is, because I think ultimately, the overglorification of the architect as an artist, as opposed to as a service provider, um, assumes that that would be the best entry point to understand something like the gender dynamic of the profession and its relationship to you know, architectural production in terms of you know the place of women. But um, in a place like Egypt, where architects saw themselves as service providers, not as artists, and they have not been celebrated by historians as artists, but rather as people who provided services. Um, a more in, in that hierarchy, uh, a person that's higher above is the client. And a lot of the clients are women. And I think this is where it becomes really interesting. Um, so quite a few of the projects upstairs, but also in, in my book, and as much as I was able to find, I wasn't honestly going out of my way to find it. But when I when I saw it, it struck me one time after another, after another, and I thought, okay, this obviously is a point, you know, only in the end of writing the book, when I was writing my introduction, I thought, yeah, this is a, a point that needs to be mentioned in the introduction, because I did sort of encounter it as I was going through. Um, but there's one thing that you said, which is the idea of propagating a style. And I would actually disagree. It wasn't so much about propagating a style. Um, it was uh, patrons creating a lot of them, for example, um, were uh, institutions that uh, or buildings that were to uh, have a charitable arm. Um, in, in one case, for example, um, at least that's in the book, um, it's a woman who is commissioning an architect to create a building that would house an institution that would be run by women, most actually all for women, except for boys uh, up until a certain age, uh, students. Um, like it had space for elderly women. It had space for women who want to leave their homes for social disputes and have a, a shelter, have a place to go to. And it had space for boys and girls um, to get primary uh, essential education uh, up until a certain age. Um, and it was all meant to be run by women. So I feel like that, where is this story in conversations around women in architecture on a global scale, for example. Right, right. Um, and so that so style wasn't the point there. It was more about this. Yeah, yeah. Then whatever the architect decided, because that's what he felt like this is what he can do, then that's what we read later on as style. For sure. You know, one one reaction that I heard actually a lot from people who had visited the exhibition and who would sort of, you know, text me later and say, Oh my God, I can't believe that uh, Uncle Soon's house was, you know, kind of mo a modernist house because everybody perceives oh, right. her as you know, a kind of guardian of traditional orthodoxies in Egypt and things like that. But, you know, for me, that maybe wasn't actually that, that surprising. Yeah. But, you know, that leads to something that I wanted to, you to also, you know, maybe articulate your perspective on the architects we see displayed, you know, over the, over the let's say, 50 years that, that span the, the exhibition. There's kind of a spectrum that goes from uh, sort of innovation, resistance, uh, uh, and, and maybe even kind of radicalism in some of the work mm -hmm. on the one hand, but then also forms of conformity, you know, government mandated uh, uh, sort of architectural plans, et cetera. And then we see the work sort of fluctuate a little bit between the two or toe the line, let's say, between these two tendencies. Mm -hmm. And we also see, you know, when we read the histories of these architects, that some of them pay a very, a very heavy price in the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, politically, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of them end up being actually kind of exiled from the profession or, or leaving Egypt altogether, uh, precisely because they're basically at the whim of these political forces. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that, that, that kind of tendency to both be very visionary and very radical, but then also to be sort of at the mercy of political winds. Yeah. Well, one thing, for example, that I find to be uh, a comforting um, parallel uh, with here, the, with Latin America, uh, which is probably why it feels natural for 
uh, someone who works on 20th century Egypt to also think about what's going on, what went on in 20th century but Latin You are in, in Mexico right now for those who uh, don't know. Yeah, and Mexico City was a very natural home uh, after living in Cairo for 10 years. Um, but what's really uh, a striking parallel is an interest in optimism rather than uh, radicalism or innovation. And I think what I would, how I would ca characterize post, uh, let's say 1920s. So Egypt had a revolution in 1919, uh, one that was of course uh, contained uh, by the British uh, back then um, uh, and led to you know, very <laughs> few concessions to the people, but it did create a class uh, that maybe we can call a bourgeois class that was interested in uh, sort of uh, embracing new spaces, creating new spaces. And this is actually the class that was then like those women that I just mentioned who were looking to fill the, the gap that was created by British economism in Egypt by creating ch charitable institutions. So this is actually where it comes in, right? So the interest in creating those kinds of spaces was actually also driven by um, yeah, a resistance to, to British colonialism and its control of the economy. Uh, but that 1919 revolution did, fought, like I said, create that class. And um, the architects uh, at the time were, uh, you know, the first couple of generations of the School of uh, Architecture that was part of Cairo University in the 1920s. You start to see them uh, taking a larger share of architectural production. Before that, it should be important to note that, um, you know, in a place like Egypt, as I would, based on just a cursory observation in many parts of the world, um, before that, again, it wasn't necessarily the architect, the celebrity that was taking on a lot of these projects, it was contractors. And so a lot of the, how the design was done in-house. So the contractor is the architect, uh, or it's all kind of one entity. Um, and, but from the 1920s, you do see, uh, yeah, that kind of uh, identity of an architect. Yeah, architect. Um, but the, those are you know tumultuous political times. Um, the 1920s have had have had their moments. The 1930s had had also pretty dark moments. Um, you know, not to mention the rise of fascism in Europe, so close by, uh, and its impact, of course, on British colonialism, which is actually fascism from from a colonized Egyptian's perspective, well, fascism has already been here for since 1882, so I'm not sure, you know what I mean? Um, and so that actually solidified British colonial uh, grip on a place like Egypt. And so that created a really difficult environment for, um, for those interested in architecture and architectural practice in Egypt. One striking example is architect Say Karim, who was mentioned in the exhibition upstairs in one of the boards. Um, he graduated in 1932. So here's a journey, you know, that kind of ticks off a few unusual boxes. He graduates from Cairo University in 1932. The university didn't have a master's program at the point. At that point, um, the university program was also dominated by British. Um, so all the top positions were given to British uh, um, yeah, faculty or, or individuals who were propagating really irrelevant things like uh, Beaux Arts and classicism. <laughs> so here is here is Egypt, um, where students go to art school and they get taught the Greek orders. You know, like uh, so it didn't seem or the you know uh, or classicism or whatever or Beaux Arts design. And so uh, it was a frustrating environment to be a student. But it, this is actually the mechanism of. Uh, creating colonized subjects who speak your way, uh, not just in linguistically. I mean, the reason we all speak English today is not because we all chose to, but it's because we are born out of that colonial concept um, in which you're supposed to speak the colonizer's language and so on. But in the terms, in terms of the architectural profession, you also speak the architectural parlance. So if this is what the Brits were interested in up until the 1930s, uh, you know, classicism and so on, then that's what they are going to spread around the world. So he resisted this. He was not welcomed as a student to resist this. He finished his degree in 32. And then he decides to go to ATH uh, in Zurich um, to get a master's. And it happens to be 1933 uh, at the height of essentially the rise of fascism next door in Germany. And so not a welcoming environment uh, for him. Um, and when he comes back in 1938, um, and by the way, he had to pay for a year of school um, at uh, ETH Zurich, which is supposedly, you know, not involved in the politics, in these kinds of politics, um, without having it count towards his degree, because they couldn't believe that an Egyptian, you know, has the brains, I guess, to, to do this. Pretty ludicrous. And that's actually what pushed him to get a PhD. And, uh, and, and, and so he did, he did, he went for one degree and he stayed on for two. 
I think, to prove a point. And he comes back in 1938, gets a teaching position um, in Cairo University, and again, is still being resisted uh, by the British um, administration for basically not walking the line of promoting um, class European classicism and uh, Beaux Arts design. This is in the late 30s. Um, so when people also talked about um, as a side point about you know why certain places have had certain stylistic uh, innovation and others didn't. Well, maybe if you didn't have British administrators sitting on your head telling you that you need to draw you know draw uh, Roman uh, Roman columns and Beaux Arts plans in the middle of the desert, maybe you would have had you know better chances at uh, being whatever innovation means in that context. But whatever, that's a side point. The point is, it's a politically difficult concept uh, and 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 context. I mean. That to, to work in. Say Kedim was very forefront about this. Um, I'll try to summarize my answer, but it's an important point because it was very clear that basically the reason that the bourgeois class was useful for architects like Say Kedim is because he was able, under these very uh, unfriendly colonial conditions, to do what he likes or what he can, um, which is actually a point that relates to what I'm about to say next. Um, you know, it's very interesting that with so-called independence 1952, which we now know is an American back crew, as was happening in Guatemala, as was happening in Iran, all around the same time, 1952 happened in Egypt. Uh, and by the way, we only got the, the leaked, not leaked, it was released information about the fact that this was an American back uh, crew right in the middle of the 2011 protests and nobody was paying attention. Uh, but for, you know, up until from 1952 until 2011, the official storyline was revolution. But now we know, well, not so revolutionary as you're being, you know, pushed by the CIA. Uh, but one of the things that that regime did was to actually cut down the um, private capital. The, the, that kind of bourgeois class lost its power within less than a decade completely. And therefore, uh, from an architect's point of view, who's seeking commissions, um, before that was your safe, uh, you know, safe embrace. You're able to practice what you can since the state is dominated by colonial officials and so on. Well, now the state was dominated by a new kind of colonial official, which is the undercover agent, uh, Egyptian, who is actually not necessarily serving, uh, you know, national interests, but is presenting himself as revolutionary. And so they were the only uh, people that architects can work for. And so you can see a lot of the architects' journeys uh, can be one. That's one lens to think about it. Um, is the relationship of the state to the bourgeois class that was pre-independence and the kind of work that the architects produced. It's a very difficult political terrain that I think you know when you talk about European architects in general or definitely white American architects. Uh, these are not issues they have to deal with. Right. Right. So the, the, there's two sort of big urgencies that anchor the show, the, the exhibition. One of them is this idea of decolonizing architecture, but also decolonizing architectural history and, and architectural narratives. And the exhibition features a kind of five points of, of uh, decolonizing architecture in the kind of either Corbusier style of five points, but also maybe as a kind of easy listicle uh, yeah. as a kind of BuzzFeed uh, yeah. uh, uh, form, which I really kind of enjoy. So that's one urgency. But then the other urgency is also uh, preservation and preservation of either uh, buildings that are currently endangered by development, uh, by master planning, by historical erasure, yeah. uh, or, or uh, also not just the disappearance of the buildings, but disappearance of the archival material uh, as, as we've, we've spoken before. So yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about that, that urgency? So the, the historic, what here would be called historic preservation? Yeah, well, actually those two urgencies, the way you posited them just now, they are, it became very clear to me how related they are. They're even much more related in my mind now than they maybe were when I was writing the text for the exhibit. Um, because I think narrative uh, are two steps ahead, actually, of physical reality. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, if you think about our conceptions of the future, a lot of what's being materialized today was already literally visualized in science fiction, American uh, science fiction in the 80s. So, you know, Facebook uh, was something that somebody wrote a novel about in the early 90s, you know, like all these uh, things that appear to be innovative and new. So narrative making 
precedes the realization of things. And I think this works also in reverse when you're trying to erase. Um, so this is why I, um, uh, you know, I take a point for against uh, William Curtis, who, who wrote the textbook that I studied uh, as a student of architecture, you know, because from the perspective of this, you know, brown person uh, studying architecture, um, it was, you know, the chapter, there was one, there's the history of architecture. First of all, it's not called the history of European and American architecture, it's called the history. It's like modern, it's like modern architecture since 1900. It's not modern American, European architecture. That's like the, the standard, that's almost the standard, the standard textbook. Textbook. every architecture student in North America will, will read. Actually, not only in North America, because it's translated into Spanish and in several, many other languages, in fact, and it is taught even even in places like Egypt itself, uh, since this is what's available. So narratives, um, it's incredible who has, who gets to have a bigger microphone. Um, you know, one of the, the problems I think with the narrative of globaliz uh, globalization is it makes it seem like that we're all somehow connected equally and potentially anybody can say something and be heard all around the place, but that's actually not how it works. I mean, in reality, you know, somebody who's maybe uh, creates an interesting book uh, like Curtis uh, gets to be translated and sells millions of copies. You know, my book sells two thousand copies, right? And that's considered mm -hmm. a huge success. But um, and that's that's fine. I'm okay with that. But my point is that other others really get to literally sell like tens and hundreds of thousands of books, and those narratives are amplified when they're translated and they're spread around the world. In that book. There's only one chapter that's dedicated essentially to the rest of the world, what's called the developing world. And nobody explains, he doesn't explain why is it developing? Um, is it recovering from uh, a trauma maybe like colonialism and extraction and you know genocides and uh, wars that nobody asked for? You know, Nobody mentions any of this, it's just developing. They're just poor. And therefore when modern architecture appears there, it's inauthentic because it's a cheap copy of what they saw somewhere else. And that's the narrative. Um, of course, when he was writing this, and this was published in 1982 in the beginning, uh, its first edition, and it still grows on until now uh, being republished. Um, you know, in, in 1982, I was born in 81. I grew up seeing exactly the physical evidence that prove otherwise, right? But in that time, since 81 when I was born and 82 when that book came out until today, that physical evidence has dwindled to almost nothing. So what I'm trying to say here is narratives um, precede the realization, the realization if they're put behind enough power. Um, and so um, decolonization has to do, I, th I would say with maybe like fine tuning the volume a bit on some voices. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not sure, I'm not saying silence anybody, but I'm also, also not saying let's not amplify uh, you know, um, a Harvard professor just because he's a Harvard professor or a Yale professor just because he's a Yale professor and we'll never get to hear what's coming out of anywhere across Africa or anywhere across the Arab region or anywhere uh, in Latin America, except the audience will always be maintained small. But um, I think within a larger kind of picture of what's going on with contemporary coloniality, uh, with the creation of the notion of the minority where we're all minorities, even, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, you're just a minority. Minority to what? To a dominant uh, hegemonic narrative that's coming out of very few places. Um, and so decolonizing for me uh, is about leveling the playing field and also losing the terminologies that we all have to abide by. This is why I actually don't buy into the notion of style because it was, it's a very convenient um, uh, a narrative point for uh, this idea of progress. How do you prove progress? So, I mean, so a lot of cultures, including many aspects of our own, believed in sort of a notion of an eternal present. Uh, that yes, things live and die, but ultimately, it's an on, it's a, it's a present. Uh, you know, you only live in the present. You know, what we call history is sort of our try, our effort to. Uh, to create uh, understanding of our memories, but there's only the present. Well, a counter to this uh, post-European enlightenment um, is the idea of, is a very clear distinction between past, present, and future. And in order to drive this, you need the benchmark to argue for a progression, a progress. And so style was a very convenient and is still a very convenient uh, mechanism to do so, even though, like I said, a lot of so-called innovation it seems to be really old ideas recycled in new form. Um, and so and these I, and I actually people... love that there's very few mentions of style actually in yeah. the descriptions of the buildings upstairs. 
but in the book and, and and in the book at large you know it's it's not it's not a book that's so concerned with with style um i want to i want to be a little bit mindful of time so i'm going to ask you one more question and then in the meanwhile uh we'll gather some questions from the audience you can just raise your hand if you have if you have a question for for muhammad um, Hamid, what's your favorite building in the in the exhibition upstairs? What's the one that you, that you look at and you're like, oh, this one, this really. You know, I'm, I'll, I'll be very, uh, and maybe now that the exhibition is coming to a close, you know, when I was doing the selection um, for the book, even it was not about what I like. Uh, of course, that influenced some of the choices. So, for example, it's very clear that I'm very drawn to say Karim as a figure. Uh, but mostly because I empathize with his narrative, because actually, uh, unfortunately, I see that when he lived from the 1930s until he was put under house arrest and have his career end in, uh, in 1965, uh, I'm kind of able to see that happening today and affecting even my own career and life in many ways. So my interest in him is more about the person as opposed to the architecture, the aesthetics. Um, but yes, he's very present. But I don't have really a favorite. Um, and when I was doing the selection, it was more based on other, um, you know, where do we have information available? What would create um, less of a monotonous uh, picture of the situation? So different types of buildings, different scales of buildings, uh, different locations of buildings. Um, you know, that those are were more interesting for me. Um, you know, sometimes I have a favorite yeah, image because I, for me as an architect, I look at them and I just kind of dissect them aesthetically, and architecturally, yeah. and I definitely have my favorites. Yeah, please share. You should be, honestly please tell us. Yes. Oh, well, mine is the the Villa Badran, or the, which is I think the last one. It's the most, the latest one in the show, and it also has a really interesting preservation story where it's been completely disfigured as a kind of restaurant and a yeah. kind of pastiche uh, uh, restaurant. So for me, it just it really encapsulates some of the, uh, some of the urgencies also of the show, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, right. should I, we take a, a few questions maybe? Yeah, let's, the audience let's, uh, while we're here. David. Sure, so actually speaking of uh, the bigger buildings, the one that one that I really found interesting was it was like um, at the American University of Cairo, and it was kind of an early forerunner in kind of energy efficiency, the way it reflected light, and it was damaged during the 2011 Arab Spring, and then was subsequently demolished in 2015. Mm -hmm. So could you, I guess it's a two part question. One, anything about that building in particular, because I was really struck by it, and two, is there a red thread to preservation efforts on the ground today either through civil society or the Lebanese government, or sorry, the Egyptian government? <laughs> um, well, great choice. I think for me, what was, there was two reasons I was interested in this building. One was uh, I came across an image of it, um, it at the American University Archive. And um, because, it, because it's a university archive, there's you know more availability of some photograph uh, phot photographic material and, and so on and so on um, and then I dug a bit deeper and also I remember it from being in Tahrir Square in 2011 uh, and actually my memory of the building was less having to do with the design but actually with the fact that it was used the rooftop was used by snipers to shoot at protesters and in fact I think that was the main motivation behind the American University uh, deciding to demolish it even though they are very reluctant to um, to to say this, hmm. um, my editor, uh, you know, knew this building. I was like, actually, I really do, <laughs> you know, and precisely because of that historical dimension. Even if that anecdote wasn't mentioned uh, in the book, but. Um, I would say, you know, what's really interesting about the design aspect of it, you know, the use of brisolets and um, energy efficient kind of passive uh, energy sort of design elements. Um, you know, there's a longer history of this, uh, much longer than that building um, in tradition, what, what it's been typically called traditional architecture. Um, but I think, uh, you know, with the separation between the modern and the traditional, and then the uh, the creation of what makes for um, uh, an energy efficient building and design. So Brissolé and all these aspects and how the building is oriented are sort of listed. Well, that one checked those marks. Um, so it, my interest in it, it really comes from both the archival bit, the, the passive uh, energy design bit, but also um, 
the historical bit, not only about when it was built, when a science program was created at the American University in Cairo, but also uh, the motivations behind why it was demolished, um, being having been basically used for criminal purposes. Um, so yeah. There was. Um, hi, uh, I'm an architecture student right now, um, and it was mentioned in my history class that um, modernism was somewhat influenced by vernacular Northern African architecture. Yeah. Um, and something I was wondering about was your take on how the influences of vernacular architecture made its way into modernism and was somehow reintroduced back to Egypt through like a so-called European migration and um, the unfair like representation that uh, it was called degenerate um, with the upcoming war on Europe. So I guess I was just wondering about your take on that. Mm. Um, well, so if we go back to that point that I was making about the notion of a, kind of an eternal present, uh, you know, a lot of one of the main motivations behind colonialism um, was to to say something along the lines that um, X and Y place um, has been stagnant for hundreds of years. And one of the evidence for this is that, look, they're still building uh, in the same way for hundreds of years. Well, now that we've tried this supposedly different approach for the last 150 years with the planet coming to a catastrophic climate, uh, you know, situation because of um, because of essentially these supposedly better approaches, um, those approaches that lasted and were perpetuated for hundreds of years don't look so bad after all. And I think maybe one of the proponents of this point of view early on was Hassan Fathi, and this is not why he's remembered, but I think this is actually one different take on. On, on reading his interest in this so-called vernacular architecture. Of course, the idea um, that North African vernacular forms influenced people like Le Corbusier when he was doing his travels early on as a student and later, uh, you know, um, these only came out much later, you know, way longer, uh, way after he died. Uh, and it was by immigrant uh, researchers, usually from places like Turkey, uh, Zeynep Celik, for example, who was actually uh, my professor at NGIT, wrote about this. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like this is a way to come to terms with the problematic narratives, but it still buys into a notion uh, that differentiates between some sort of modern, whatever that means, and some sort of traditional, whatever that means. I'm more now thinking that, uh, you know, architecture is either good for the environment and the society and or not. Um, so these should be really the terms um, by which we think about architecture, uh, not pigeonhole it into, into some sort of uh, temporal framework. Um, and I think, honestly, what's going on uh, in terms, I mean, architecture as a profession is still failing to really uh, come to terms with the impact of architecture on the environment, right? Um, and so a lot of these so-called vernacular forms uh, are proven to, you know, modernism, modernity, whatever that is, uh, came and went, and these forms uh, are still doing pretty okay. Um, so I would actually move, I think now that already 20 years ago, some historians drew the connection between such vernacular forms and the evolution of modern aesthetics. So for example, I like to always uh, tell my Western educated friends who really believe that a flat facade, uh, the lack, you know, the notion that decoration uh, or the lack of, uh, thereof is a sign of modernity. Well, look at any village house almost anywhere from um, Morocco to Egypt uh, before the destruction of these villages more recently because of economic pressures. Um, and yeah, you see flat facades, flat roofs, cubic forms. Uh, pretty generous windows actually to let in sunlight. And so therefore these kinds of elements that were pointed out um, maybe you know, a century ago by Le Corbusier, this is why when I propose my five points to decolonize architecture, they're not about aesthetics, um, which has been uh, kind of the profession's response to, uh, to localizing design by you know, uh, using aesthetics as a corrective. Well, I think it's about perception um, approaches to understanding built form uh, and the structural systemic um, yeah, conditions around the knowledge production around architecture. So I would focus on that moving forward since 20 years ago, those parallels between vernacular architecture and the modern have already been uh, drawn out. There's two more questions. One here and one. 
Um, hi, I have a question. So um, one of the things that really intrigued me about your exhibit is how little represented Muslim Egyptian architects are during that era, during the 1900s. So most of the names I saw were predominantly uh, of Levantine origin and predominantly not Muslim with the exception of maybe Sayyid Karim and like someone else. So I'm just curious, like how come Muslims in Egypt made up like 90% of the population yet were so little represented based off of that well, based off of what I saw. Now, here's the thing. I'm not right-wing. Like, I'm not, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not low-key Islamist. I'm just, like, super curious as, like, why are there so few Muslim names? This is so interesting. The, it seems uh, an American audience is very interested in religious identity. Um, I think because it's been politicized in a certain way. Honestly, I did not even think about this at all. I was looking at architects and what they've done and the people who drew me because of their narratives and their work. Uh, if that's an observation that unfortunately the exhibit might have uh, transmitted to you, that's not representative of the situation whatsoever. It's nowhere near close. Um, but um, again, when I was making my selection, I wasn't trying to do like, oh, uh, let's do a checkbox of how many religious identities are represented here. I mean, the re religious question uh, came up in another uh, context in relation to, you know, a Jewish uh, Egyptian architect, uh, where actually his identity, his religious identity wasn't. Uh, apparently an issue for him at all up until he immigrated in the 70s. Um, he's the designer, Noam Shabib was up in the exhibition. And when I, after the exhibit open, was able to communicate with his family, the family said, why is this an issue? Why, I don't understand why his religion is coming up in an architecture exhibition. And so that would be kind of my way to answer your question about why are there Muslim supposedly architects lacking? I wasn't trying to represent a religious identity or another. You know, in, in, in some other space, maybe someone would think, oh, well, look at that, a Muslim, someone by the name Muhammad, who by the way, doesn't, you don't get to see a lot of Muhammad's curating many things. I would ask, maybe I would flip the question and say, why is it that today, uh, you know, people with my first name or supposedly my religious identity are very underrepresented in curating exhibitions and doing publications on architecture in the United States, uh, which is supposedly so open. Maybe that's actually a more relevant question. Um, but uh, to your point, um, yeah, when I was doing my selection, I was not looking to represent certain identities religiously, certainly not. This is, we're talking about a primarily secular society. And when we say secular, it doesn't mean that they are anti-religion. In fact, that's not the necessarily the point is just means that they don't identify by religion. Um, and I think this is actually precisely one of the things that British colonial administrators hated about Egypt. <laughs> you know, the fact that there was interreligious marriage, interreligious communities, interreligious neighborhoods. Um, these are the people who wanted to separate countries and communities, look at what they've done in India and Pakistan and look at what they've done in Palestine. Uh, these are, you know, a lot of a lot of it was motivated by the British, and it's all about a very mono cultural perspective on how communities should live. And actually it projects until the present on how um, American and British perspectives on integration of different religious communities should operate. You know, there's still, we're still struggling to integrate. These are societies uh, in that 20th century, part of the 20th century that despite colonialism were quite integrated and in the professional sphere uh, and uh, in the society that was commissioning them to do work. So. I was embracing that perspective where, yeah, the religious identity of an architect was really not an issue for me at all, but. Thanks, Tama. We'll take one more question and then we'll break. Um, my question was on uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and his relationship with Cairo and the region more broadly. I thought that panel was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, just like um, I picked on William Curtis as a historian who shapes our narrative, um, I thought when I came across um, the encounter of Frank Lloyd Wright in Cairo, which was published in Al Amara magazine that's featured upstairs um, in one of the walls, I was shocked. Um, and it's funny because it seems to me like the editors of the magazine sort of just deliver, like, delivered verbatim what happened uh, because it was kind of more of a report on what happened as opposed to 
um, and a, an engagement. Uh, there was no like critique of what he said. There was no uh, counterpoint to what he said. It was just kind of like, uh, and we invited Frank Lloyd Wright on his way back to Baghdad and we gave him a tour and this is what he said. <laughs> and it was just kind of matter of fact. And then when I read it, I thought this is absurd. Um, having now, of course, the hindsight of knowing what was he doing in Baghdad and the kinds of things he was proposing there and what were these architects doing in Egypt at the time. Uh, so he, you know, uh, I don't want to repeat the panel, but for those who maybe haven't seen the exhibit, basically Frank Lloyd Wright was part of a, a cohort of uh, European and American architects who were being invited, by the way, by a British uh, backed, again, uh, regime uh, in Iraq. And the only reason that the British were interested in Iraq was because of oil. So nothing really has changed um, at all. Um, and architecture was being utilized in order to quell revolution. And so what, and well, this sounds to me like what Dubai, it sounds to me like the whole Gulf, how to use architecture and, and sort of architectural blitz uh, to quell um, any desire for actual structural, social, economic change. Um, so he was invited to build an opera house and he proposed one that has um, an, an, like a hundred meter tall statue of an eighth century figure that nobody you know, would have cared to see a hundred meter statue of. Um, and then he comes to Cairo and he sees architects who are building, you know, pretty, um, um, uh, yeah, no, certainly no hundred meter statues, um, <laughs> um, structures that are post offices, hospitals, and schools. And to him, it was cheap architecture. Um, and thought, as and I thought to myself, you know, we glorify or we're told to glorify the wrong people. But maybe it's not about the right people and the wrong people. I would say the answer is to just not glorify anyone. Just like no voices should be amplified too much. No one should be a little too rich, <laughs> you know. No one should be a little too glorified because nobody's perfect. Um, um, and I think um, to, to sort of try with my little anecdote about Frank Lloyd Wright in Egypt to to just say like I'm not really sure why this person is, is is on a pedestal. He doesn't sound like a really nice guy. Neither did he really have the best, more interesting things to say about architectural production uh, in this particular place, nor what he was proposing for a place like Baghdad. Uh, and so this is kind of where that comes from. Um, there's a kind of, again, part of, I think, if we're serious about decolonizing narratives, and that's a challenge for Western institutions, since Western institutions are the ones that have and drive the colonizing narratives until today. Um, so, the, you know, I, I wouldn't go to someone in Egypt and be like, decolonize your narrative. You know, that's not how it works. You know, the, those responsible for decolonizing narratives are the ones who are perpetuating colonial narratives. Um, one of the things I would say is uh, even the playing field, you know, let's take some people off the pedestal, let's de-amplify some voices. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say on that panel. It's a great, great way to, um, to end this, Hamad. And for all those who haven't checked it out, I would encourage everyone to see that last room of the exhibition that again talks about this exchange between New York and Cairo, basically Frank Lloyd Wright coming to uh, Cairo and kind of critiquing local architecture, but also Egypt designing its own pavilion at the New York World's Fair and sort of what that, what that would have looked like uh, had it actually been built. Uh, so really interesting way to also kind of conclude the show. Uh, I wanna once again, uh, thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the Center for Architecture for having us tonight and for having this wonderful exhibition. Uh, I mean, if I may say one thing. Yes, go ahead. So the um, basically uh, a next chapter of the exhibit will hopefully happen uh, later this year here in Mexico City in the spirit of decolonization, in the spirit of South-South exchange. Um, you know, we tend to always have to talk, you know, Egypt versus the West, uh, Lebanon versus the West, you know, it's always like a kind of a back and forth uh, South-North conversation, very little South-South. So um, a next chapter of the exhibition is now being dreamed up here here for Mexico City um, that would include sort of elements that bring in, it wouldn't be exactly the same exhibit, it would be the whole thing would be basically redesigned completely, recurated completely with content that relates what was going on in Mexico and what was going on in Egypt. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, since essentially funding sources, and this is actually part of the colonial situation that we all live in, are dependent on certain institutions that are have not expressed very much interest in South-South um, exchanges, um, basically trying to do this as a self-funded exhibition or with 
uh, your help as New Yorkers who are present. The 20 um, plexiglass panels that are exhibited, once the exhibit comes out, uh, comes uh, off the wall tomorrow, uh, they're available essentially to be, you can have one of them. I don't know what, to, I don't want to call it purchase because it's not really a purchase. You're essentially going to be supporting uh, a self-independently ind funded uh, next chapter of the exhibit uh, here in Mexico that would hopefully open in the fall, uh, so a year after the one that opened in uh, in New York. Um, and so, if you're interested in any of the panels, uh, please maybe um, get my contact from uh, Rami or tell uh, Rami if you know someone who might be interested. Um, so each one can go for five hundred dollars, and that would make you immediately basically on the wall here in Mexico when the exhibit opens as a funder. Uh, so think of it as actually trying to spread uh, this kind of information and knowledge and it would be done in both uh, English and Spanish. So if you can also make it to Mexico in the fall, please do. So thank you for that. Definitely. Great idea, Mohammed. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.